Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's wonderful session of the Teacher Institute Revolutionary Science live webinar series. Um, tonight's guest is Dr. Clive Wynn, and I'm in, my name is Bertha Vasquez, and these are my dogs. This is Kai right here, and this is Jinx over here. And um, Dr. Wynn is taking care of some PowerPoint issues, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce him and talk a little bit about tonight's webinar while he works out the situation. I'm also gonna put my dogs down because they don't really wanna be here. Okay, but it's about dogs. So I thought I'd start with them. Tonight's guest, I'm very excited. His name is Clive Wynn. He's the founding director of the Canine Science Collaborator of Arizona State University, Collaboratory, excuse me, of Arizona State University. Previously, he was the founding director of the Canine Cognition and Behavior Lab in the United States. He's a native of the United Kingdom, and he's lived and worked in Germany and Australia, as well as the United States. He gives frequent talks to paying audiences around the world. He's the author of several previous academic books and have more than 100 peer-reviewed scientific journal articles that count among the most highly cited studies in dog psychology. He's also published pieces in Psychology Today, New Scientist, and the New York Times. He's appeared in several television documentaries about, about dog science and on National Geographic Explorer, PBS, and the BBC. He has a dog named Zephos that he loves very much, and as I mentioned, he's the founding director of the Canine Science Collaboratory of Arizona State. And since he loves dogs and he loves researching dogs, he decided to write a book about animal behavior science with a dash of evolutionary biology as it pertains to dogs. So what he wanted to do is answer the question, why do dogs love us? So I'm, I'm a canine scientist, canine behavioral scientist. And I, I love everything about dogs and everything about what dogs do. And one, of the, one of the fascinating levels of thinking about dogs is where do dogs come from? How do we understand the heritage of dogs? You know, each of us knows where we got our dog from and knows that, that, that our dog has some parents somewhere out in the world. But you follow it back, where do dogs come from and how do dogs come into being? And it's really very interesting that people going back long before Darwin, long before Darwin, centuries before Darwin, people understood that dogs had derived from wild animals. And in fact, going back several centuries, people had some pretty good guesses. Most people could see that dogs were derived from wolves, a few, which is correct. And a few people thought dogs or some breeds of dogs maybe might be derived from jackals, which is not on the money, but it's not such a terrible mistake. Um, so, um, so yeah, people before Darwin could understand that dogs were an example of an animal that had changed. Even though there was the ancient belief that species could never change, dogs were an exception. And people were able to make that exception in their minds because they thought that we human beings had done it. So they didn't think that dogs had come about by nature's action. They thought that dogs had been created by human action. And that's still a very widespread belief. There are, there are, and again, if I have my PowerPoint, I have a slide that shows you the covers of a few books that are very recent books that uh, continue this theme that human beings actually invented dogs. Um, and the most common belief as to why, how that came about is that you see people, even people in parts of the world where they don't have modern uh, technology and they don't have agriculture, but you see people hunting with dogs and you see how phenomenally useful dogs are for hunters. And so there's this thought that maybe our ancestors thousands of years ago, they were hunting and somehow they got this idea that hunting with dogs might be a, a benefit, that the dog might be able to help you. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. They got this, our ancestors thousands of years ago, before there were any dogs, they got the idea that wolves might be able to help them. And so the theory goes that our ancestors started capturing wolf pups and taking them with to go hunting with them. 
And, you know, that's an interesting idea. A lot of smart people have believed that viewpoint, and I've investigated it in some detail. And again, if I had the pictures, I would show you. I went with an anthropologist and I went hunting with a tribe in Nicaragua, the Mayangna people. And of course, they're modern people. They're, they're our contemporaries. But the way they hunt is somewhat like our ancestors might have hunted. And it was really cool going out into the rainforest hunting with these people. And they have dogs and the dogs are tremendously helpful, tremendously helpful. Um, and uh, and yeah, so so that really shows that hunting with dogs is something that almost anybody can do with almost any kind of dog. And um, so the question then is, could you have done that with wolves? Could people have done that with wolves? And I made a trip to Israel looking for the origins of wolves. And on my last day in Israel, I went to a kibbutz uh, and at this kibbutz, there are two filmmakers. They make documentary movies. And, um, and they told me about how they had wanted to make a movie about the origin of dogs, where they went hunting with wolves and they attempted to demonstrate for their movie that hunting with wolves is something that our ancestors might have been able to do. And they showed me the little, a little snippet of the movie. And I was kind of surprised because it really seemed like they had this guy and they dressed him up in a loincloth and, um, and he had a bow and arrow and he went out and they made it seem like he shot a deer. And it, they made it seem like the wolves that he was with had ran after the deer and had brought it down and had captured it for him and all this kind of good stuff. And I was kind of puzzled because I've spent a fair bit of time around hand-reared wolves out at Wolf Park in Indiana, where they're really good at hand-rearing wolves. And although they have quite a strong relationship with their wolves, one of the things they would never dream of doing is taking food away from a wolf. You know, if you have anything to do with wolves, even the most carefully hand-reared wolves, taking food away from them is a really bad idea. And so I was puzzled that in this movie that these guys in Israel have made, they had actually shot footage where the, where the actor dressed as a hunter from thousands of years ago had apparently been able to take a deer carcass away from the wolves. And they said to me, well, yeah, actually that part of the movie making, that didn't go so well. And actually the actor got kind of badly hurt when we tried to do that. And so it was really interesting that in their attempt to dramatize and demonstrate how our ancestors might have been able to hunt with wolves, they had actually, the truth is, they had discovered exactly what I suspected, that you cannot use a wolf as an ally to help you hunt. And aside from anything else, a wolf has no motivation to help you hunt. The wolf has nothing to gain by helping people hunt because a wolf is fully effective in hunting on its own. The whole reason from the dog's point of view that going hunting with people makes sense for the dog is because most of our dogs are ineffective hunters. Very few, I mean, I know my dog, my beloved Zephos, she sometimes goes out in the backyard and she sometimes kills a bird and she sometimes bites its head off. And I'm sure many of you have dogs who on some occasion, and now my PowerPoint is starting up, on some occasion may go out and kill something, right? But people have studied free living dogs and they cannot find anywhere in the world whole populations of dogs who support themselves entirely by hunting the way almost all wolves do. So this is a really big difference between wolves and dogs. Wolves can hunt on their own. They do hunt on their own. And when they go hunting, no wolf ever ran after a deer, brought the deer down, and then called out so that the humans could catch up. When you go hunting with dogs in Nicaragua in the rainforest, the dogs run after the prey, small deer, various other things. They run after the prey. But because dogs are relatively small and puny, they are usually not able to complete the job. And so they stop and they make a noise so that the humans come running up. In the my, case of the Mayangna people nowadays, they come running up with their machetes. And with their machetes, they finish the kill. 
and now the humans have the meat and they'll share some with the dogs. So the dogs are motivated to do this task that wolves won't do. So I don't think it's possible that people created dogs by capturing wolf pups to help them hunt and selecting the friendliest wolf pups to be the parents of the next generation and intentionally creating the dog out of wolves. I don't think that's possible. Okay then, if that's not the true origin story of the dogs, what could be? And the major alternative idea about how wolves, how dogs came into being is that actually dogs did it on their own. If you look around the world, step outside the first world bubble that I'm sure most of you like me live in, go to, go to the Caribbean. I mean, it's not the third world, but it's not as wealthy as the United States or Northern Europe. Go to uh, anywhere in Africa, anywhere in South America, go south or east in Europe. Where do you see the dogs? You see the dogs on the sides of streets, wherever there is trash. Dogs are among the community of species that feast on human leavings. And we human beings have been leaving trash since back in the last ice age, maybe 15, 20,000 years. And that I think is where dogs originated. There are parts of the world where wolves scavenge on human trash dumps. You see it up in the far north, in Northern Canada, in Alaska, probably, although I don't know for a fact, in Russia, Poland, I don't know exactly, Scandinavia. Wolves have been seen scavenging on trash dumps in Scandinavia. And, um, also in Israel, in the Negev desert, where there is really very little to hunt, wolves hang around the human trash dumps. So today, to this very day, there are wolves hanging around trash dumps. And I think it's most likely that that is where dogs came into being. That certain tribes of wolves, excuse me, certain tribes of wolves started specializing on human trash. And as they did that, they adapted, they evolved to become human trash specialists. That's not as romantic as the idea that they came into being by helping us hunting, but I think it's more likely. And um, then when the ice age came to an end and forests became much thicker and denser, we human beings had a problem. We were, our ancestors were great at hunting in open environments, and in very sparse forests that you find in cold environments, such as we're everywhere in the last ice age, we have terrific vision, which works really well in those kinds of environments. As the world warmed up, forests got thicker and it became much more difficult for humans to hunt because we couldn't see what was in the forest. And we also, we don't have any other way of spotting it. Our senses of smell are not strong enough. So that's where we found that these animals that had come into being quite possibly without us hardly noticing it, these animals that had come into being on the trash dump, sort of wolfy things, but not as aggressive, not as strong, uh, but still with a desire to hunt if they can spot something. You know, I think that's where it started. I think some of the wolfy doggy things on the trash dump followed the human hunters out one day and both sides found that they could use each other, that they had complementary skills. And so I, my guess is that's where it started. And, um, and I think, you know, the rest, as they say, is history, a beautiful partnership. And uh, in the PowerPoint, which I can now see, but I'm not gonna try and share with you because let's not push our luck. Uh, in the PowerPoint, I have some pictures of cold climates where humans hunt easily warmer climates where it's difficult for humans to hunt. I have a graph from an archaeologist about how, um, how when you look for where people buried dogs, you find that burying dogs really became a big thing at the end of the last ice age, suggesting that people really started to care about these animals. And then I also have a couple of slides where I show you a piece of research that uh, my collaborators and I have done where we've actually been able to uncover genetic mutations, differences in the genes between wolves and dogs uh, that account for 
how dogs are so much more affectionate than even the most carefully hand-reared wolves. Uh, so dogs have evolved as, as a quite remarkable capacity, really exceptional capacity, to form strong emotional bonds with almost everything that they meet. And we see it in their reaction towards us, but you can also see it in if you raise a dog. I visited some goat ranches here in Arizona. If you raise dog pups with goats, the dogs grow up seeking to form emotional bonds with goats the way that we're used to seeing dogs forming strong emotional, emotional bonds with us. And we identified three genes that uh, mutated in the journey from wolf to dog that account for this difference in the drive and desire to form strong bonds. So, um, so that, in a, that in a nutshell is how I think dogs came into being. And I think it's, a, it's, an, amazing, it's an amazing story. And I think that, yeah, as I, as I hope I explained, it came in waves, that there were different steps. And that initially, probably initially, people didn't care about these animals. Probably they were quite indifferent to them. But when the world warmed up, and our ancestors had this terrible problem, really. I always thought the end of the Ice Age sounded like a good thing. You know, I don't like the idea of an Ice Age. <laughs> but uh, actually, for our ancestors, it, it created new problems. And it was only because they had dogs uh, that dogs had come into being, that they were able to, to make progress. So there we go. That's my story. Well, thank you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I see we have quite a few questions for you. And I also have questions for you because I, I read your book. Um, our first question comes from Pat Parnell, uh, who asks, did Homo sapiens sapiens domesticate dogs in the way you're discussing, or was it an earlier or another kind of hominid? So I think, so this is a matter of controversy at the moment among archeologists and also geneticists get into this because geneticists reckon that they can figure out when mutations took place and when animals changed. I think this is still very up in the air. There are people who argue that dogs came into being 30, 40, 50,000 years ago. And if that was the case, then there were still Neanderthals around at that time. And there is um, Shipman, what's her first name? I've forgotten her first name, hang on. I have it here. Um, there is a book came out in which um, Shipman, what's her first name? Uh, Pat Shipman. Pat Shipman argued that, um, that it was actually developing dogs that gave our ancestors, Homo sapiens sapiens, the edge over Neanderthals. But I think she's wrong because I don't think dogs go back that far. I side with the archeologists and geneticists who place the origin of dogs still in the last ice age, but only maybe 15 to 20,000 years ago. And my understanding is that by then there really were not any Neanderthals left. So I don't think, I think it would have been Homo sapiens sapiens. So we have a question from Aaron Fisher that I think is very important. Thank you, Aaron, because part of your book talks about how we now have a responsibility to dogs. Uh, and I talked about that a little bit when you were get, getting your computer back going on it yeah. again. So the question is, while many of us may love certain dog breeds, the vast majority of us don't need a specific breed anymore. Would it be more humane to let breeds essentially die out and mixed breeds become the norm so that there's less inbreeding and more hybrid vigor, thus healthier dogs? Well, so I'm, I'm scared of offending somebody because I know how very, very strongly people love particular breeds of dog, and I'm not gonna hold that against anybody, but it is also the case that the inbreeding that created the different breeds of dogs is far more intense than most people seem to realize. So many, many breeds of dog are made up of individuals who are more closely related to each other than just a brother and sister mating. Because when they created these breeds in the late 19th and early 20th century, they inbred and inbred and inbred. They didn't have any understanding of genetics at a formal level. So they didn't know the risk they were taking with such intense inbreeding. So there are breeds of dog there was a study in the UK, and I'm not going to remember which breed it was, whether it was a pug, it was one of the smushy faced breeds. And there are several tens of thousands of individuals of this breed in existence in Britain. And yet a genetic analysis showed that although there were many thousands of individuals, genetically, they were equivalent to just a few dozen 
individual dogs, truly outbred dogs. So the level of inbreeding is much more intense than people realize. And the problem with that is that when people were inbreeding to capture the traits that they were interested in, so they inbred um, to create golden retrievers that reliably breed as, you know, having the golden coat that is what you expect to see on a golden retriever. So at some level informally, they knew they were capturing the genes for the characters that they wanted. But what they had no understanding of in those days is that when you inbreed, you also capture by accident genes for hidden traits. And many of those hidden traits are deleterious. So there are many breeds of dog that have very high rates of certain cancers and other genetic diseases. Um, and so it's really, really quite tragic that these inbred, purebred dogs have much shorter lifespans uh, than, than they could have. So the thing is, for me personally, yes, I'm happy with outbred dogs. I'm happy with mutts. I like that hybrid vigor. But actually, with the knowledge we have today, breeders could outbreed gently enough to get rid of the, um, the uh, I'm sorry, I'm dis detract distracted because somebody's written in caps, dogs get cancer, exclamation point, question mark. Well, yeah, Kenny, aka Kelvin, there are breeds of dog more than half of all the individuals will die of just a handful of cancers because the cancer genes were captured in the creation of those breeds. And the thing is, we could fix this. Dog breeders could fix this if they wanted to, if they were not obsessed with keeping the stud books completely closed, if they were not obsessed with only ever breeding registered golden retrievers to registered golden retrievers, if they would allow a little bit of, sure, a closely related breed to come in, they could breed out these cancer genes. They don't have to have them. And that has been done in Dalmatians. It wasn't a cancer. I think it was a liver disease. I'm afraid I forget exactly. But every single Dalmatian registered in the United States got this disease during its life if it didn't die of an accident beforehand. And they were able to fix that. They were able to fix that. That can be dealt with. But breeders are very locked into their traditions and very reluctant to do what could be done. Um, Dr. Wynn, you have a lot of young people here. And so I'm getting the question, being a dog scientist sounds fun. Where did you go to school for animal behavior? Um, well, so I haven't always been a dog scientist. It's something that came to me about 15 years ago, so a little while ago. I've always been fascinated by the minds of animals and animal behavior and animal psychology sit in the space between traditional psychology departments and traditional biology departments. So if you're interested in the kinds of things I do, when you go to college, you ought to look for a school which is strong in life sciences, biology, and that has a psychology department that is one of the kinds of psychology departments that's also interested in the minds of animals. Traditionally, psychology departments, of course, they're interested in the human mind, but some psychology departments also have faculty interested in animal minds. And then if you double major in psychology and biology, you can take the best from both sides. And um, that's and really what I double majored in. Say again, sorry. That's exactly what I double majored. Oh, there you go. There you go. Um, so this, I got to ask a question because one of the things in your book is very interesting is that if dog shelters stopped naming or even trying to guess the breed of the dog, the dogs were adopted more readily. And not just the pit bull type dogs, but all the dogs seem to be adopted more readily. You explain why in the book. But I want to, and I'm sorry, I'm sure you've been asked this a zillion times, but pit bulls. If, if in the 1980s and 90s they were bred for aggression, are we not now seeing that particular breed of dog just more aggressive or am i completely off base that is it just the media that promotes this concept that pit bulls are more aggressive what what is your take on that so what's what's interesting is that um pit bull is not even a breed of dog so pit bull is a is a name that gets applied to a certain group of dogs that have yeah. a certain typical shape but yeah, actually, the, but actually uh, you know, they're, they're very varied, very varied. And I don't doubt that some of them can be quite aggressive, 
But for that matter, there are golden retrievers that have really hurt people. And on the other hand, there are many of the dogs that get given this label who are the sweetest pups you will ever come across. And um, and so what I always, and actually, so Pitbull is not a breed of dog. It's just a broad grouping. But even when we talk about what are the breeds, German Shepherds, Golden Retrievers, and all the rest of them, there have been very few studies looking at this. There have actually only been two big studies that have looked at this. And what they found was that there was as much variation within each breed as there is between the breeds. That's so, amazing to me because they're so like into talking about this type of dog is loyal and this type of right, dog. Right, 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 right. So of course there are certain things. So if you are gonna go, if you're the kind of person that needs a pointer, which is a dog which has a very strange habit of when it sees prey, it doesn't run after the animals. It just stands still and sort of points itself at them. It's a very strange characteristic behavior. And if you need or want that behavior, only pointers show that behavior. Certain breeds of dog are called herders because they love rounding things up. Border collies are herders. If you need a dog to herd, you're gonna need to get a herding dog. Most of us though, we're not gonna herd anything. We don't no. need our dog to point at prey. Most of us I just want a pointer. Just kidding. Sorry. Say, I missed what you said. I said I need a dog to herd my students. There you go, there you go. I'm afraid that's a skill beyond my <laughs> dog. <laughs> But if you just want a companion, a dog that's good to hang out with, then knowing the breed is not much help. What I say to people is when you're looking for canine companionship, treat it the same way as when you're looking to make a new human friend. Very few of us, I hope, would say, well, I've got to have somebody who's six foot six because that's the only kind of person I can make friends with. Or, you know, all the other ways that people might be described. What we say is, you're trying to make a new friend, give yourself a chance to get to know this person. Could Billy be your new friend? I don't know. What do you like to do? What does Billy like to do? Get to know each other. And what's true for our own species is just as true for dogs as well. When you're looking to have a new dog friend, get to know the dog. If you're a runner and you wanna have a dog that runs with you, hopefully, you'll be looking at a place where they'll let you borrow the dog, foster the dog maybe. A lot of shelters encourage fostering now. Take the dog home for a weekend. You know, I'm not a runner. I don't want to have a dog that wants to be running all the time. It'd be the last thing I want. Uh, but it's not about the breed. It's about the character of the individual. That's what you need to get to know. That's a great answer. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. uh, David Upegi asks, and again, this is in your book as well. So this is a great question. What are your feelings about cloning dogs? And there are places now that are willing to do this. You mentioned uh, Barbara Streisand's dog in your book. <laughs> so cloning is very, very interesting to me as a scientist, right? Because it's absolutely fascinating. Clones are individuals who have the exact same genetic material, the exact same genetic material. So it's very, very interesting. And, and I visited with a guy here in Phoenix who had his dog cloned and I visited with him and met his two clones. I'm not in favor of it. I think if you have $50,000 to spend on a dog or dogs, there are far wiser ways of spending your money. But on the other hand, for me, as somebody who wants to understand what makes a dog tick, to go and visit a guy who cloned his dog and who now had two two-year-old young dogs who were genetically absolutely identical and to visit with them, and to find out that their personalities are really very different, that was really eye-opening. I'd always known intellectually that our genes cannot determine our personalities, that every single life experience we have from when we're in our mother's womb up to whatever happened this afternoon, every single one of those life experiences contributes to the personality, to the person that we are. I'd always known that intellectually, but to actually see it so visibly in front of me in the person of two genetically identical dogs who nonetheless had very different personalities, that was really, really vivid for me. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. More questions. So, oof. <sighs> Yeah, my dogs are having a, some, a good time back there. Um, this is 
I can't see the name of this person. I'm sorry for not naming you. We have a mixed dog we adopted from a rescue. Very trainable and loving. He guards my husband's belongings and he's verging on aggression when guarding an item and appears very anxious. Google articles calls this resource guarding. Guys, stop. <laughs> Usually it's harmless, but he has snapped at my kids if they get too close. Any oh, ideas or strategies for breaking this habit? Well, you know, I'm I'm not a dog trainer, and I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't pretend to step in. And indeed, to some degree, anybody who would claim to give advice without visiting with you and seeing the full dynamics of the family situation, um, I wouldn't trust people who would give that kind of advice. Unfortunately, dog training and dog behavioral advice is a completely unregulated profession, at least in the United States. Yeah. So you have to be very careful. There are untrained charlatans out there. I would recommend finding somebody who's uh, registered with the Association of Professional Dog Trainers. Victoria Stillwell Academy is, is good. Karen Pryor Academy is another reputable outfit. There are reputable people out there, um, but it's worth getting professional advice from somebody who really knows what they're talking about. And they need to see the dogs and see the interaction, which of course right. is, going to be, is going to be tricky in the pandemic, but I know uh, that some of these people can work through, um, through video conferencing and so on. Um, so here's a question from Jessica Tyson. Um, you mentioned in the book how your it, the idea of the the dog is part of a wolf pack and you have to dominate the dog and that that that's not how dogs work and even wolf packs in the wild don't work that way. So she asks, can you speak to the power of classical conditioning and positive reinforcement in training a pet dog? Sure, sure. So this is a fascinating, fascinating issue that's come up. So there is a guy who's probably at the present time, the world's most well-known dog trainer on television, says in Milan with the dog whisperer. And he says that your dog will only listen to what you say if you convey to your dog through physical force that you are the boss, that you're in charge, that you're the alpha. Well, I'm sorry, but that is complete nonsense. Now, there's a part of what he says that's true. The part of what he says that's true is that your dog is looking up to you for leadership. Your dog looks to the humans in the house to show how things should be done. And, you know, I mean, your dog, those of us that are parents, we remember when our kids were small and they were completely dependent on us. They couldn't find food on their own. They couldn't even use the bathroom without us, right? When they were little. Thankfully, in my family, that stage is long past. But what's interesting to think about is that your dog is always in that stage of life. Your dog always needs to ask you, I want food. Give me food. I need to use the bathroom. Let me go where it's okay for me to be doing that business, right? Everything your dog needs, your dog looks to you for guidance, for support, everything. Now, that's true, but it does not imply, it does not mean that you need to be violent and hurtful towards your dog to convey that to your dog. I like to say, if you're the one who can open the kibble bag, who can open the, it's a shame you can't see me because I'm doing the, doing the movements here, open the kibble bag, open the, um, you know, open the can of dog food, open the door. If that's your role in the home, and I'm sure it is, then your dog looks up to you your dog looks to you for that leadership and guidance. And you can and you should provide that leadership and guidance in the most gentle way possible. And when you need to teach your dog something, don't try and teach your dog by kicking him or using a nasty shock collar or whatever. Just reward what you're looking for with food treats. Simple, positive conditioning is all you need. And your dog will understand that. Your dog understands perfectly well that you're in charge. You don't need to do anything nasty to him to convey that to him. This guy behind me on the chair, he's getting his canine good citizen certificate and it's all about positive clicker training. Awesome. Yeah. So um, I have another question. Where do Australian, this is from Pat McGuinness, where do Australian dingoes fit in the dog wolf spectrum? 
Dingoes are absolutely fascinating. Dingoes are almost, but not quite, the missing link between wolf and dog. So dingoes are these native Australian dogs. Now they're not native like marsupials, like kangaroos are native. Kangaroos and all the marsupials go back millions of years. Dingoes came to Australia sometime three, four, five thousand years ago, which is much more recent. They were brought to Australia by people, people who are coming from Southeast Asia. They were dogs. They were definitely dogs. But when they got to Australia, I was saying to you about how most dogs cannot hunt. When dingo dogs came to Australia, they found themselves in a new environment, quite unlike any other environment that dogs had occupied. I was telling you about how historically, prehistorically, dogs were living on trash. There wasn't any trash in Australia. The population density of humans is so thin in Australia that there really wasn't enough trash for the dingo dogs to be able to continue that lifestyle. On the other hand, there was lots and lots of prey and no offense to my marsupial friends, but the marsupials were really easy for these dingo dogs to catch. And so we say that evolution can never run backwards. And yet in the case of dingoes, it sort of did. And so dingoes now have most of the lifestyle habits of wolves and very few of the lifestyle habits of dogs. You cannot make a pet of a dingo, certainly not in the way. So I visited, I'm, I'm, I lived for 10 years in Australia and I'm an Australian citizen and my wife's family are from there and I go back often. And I visited these guys, two guys who have dingoes living with them in their home. And when you drive up, it's just a house in the suburbs. You drive up to this house, they have chicken wire over all the windows because you cannot have open windows in a home with dingoes. They just escape. They have, they let the dingoes inside the rooms in the house. There were no, no surfaces in the house that you could not wipe clean because you cannot house train dingoes. <laughs> so they no. had, um, they told me they had, I forget now, maybe a dozen dingoes. And they told me that every now and then one of the dingoes escapes. And the dingoes always come home, but they don't come home until they've eaten every cat in the neighborhood. Oh boy. The dingoes are unlike normal dogs. Dingoes are phenomenally successful hunters. Terror, including they've killed children, right? I mean, yeah. children have been killed in Australia by dingoes. Um, dingoes, unlike dogs, are very successful hunters and do not need humans to finish the kill for them. They go off and they kill and they eat what they've killed. And as I say, in a suburban environment, they uh -huh. get their way. Sorry, they, my dogs are uh, playing the part for you here. That's great. I'm getting the sound effects and everything. Yeah. They will, the dingoes will eat everything that they can and, and yeah, they'll come back to the humans once there's nothing more left to eat. I'd like to end with a question um, about Williams syndrome. I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Humans have, if they have the same alleles for this, these particular genes that the dogs have, the children show very friendly, I don't want to say dog-like behavior, but could you explain what Williams syndrome is? Absolutely. So Williams syndrome is a very rare syndrome in human beings caused by damage to a large number, more than two dozen genes. And so if you have this syndrome, you have damage to a lot of genes. And so you show a lot of different physical characteristics. People with Williams syndrome have a rather strange facial shape. They suffer heart problems, uh, circulation problems, a number of things. But the most curious thing is people with Williams syndrome are the most friendly people you will ever come across. They are unbelievably friendly to the point that it's rather dangerous because they don't understand as children that not everybody is safe, right? There's, you know, we teach our children about stranger danger. Kids with Williams syndrome can never grasp the concept of stranger danger. They just treat everybody as a, as a friend. Now, what's very, very interesting is that there are now geneticists who are comparing the genetic material of wolves and to the genetic material of dogs. All of our dogs are descended from wolves. 
we should be able to see where the genes have changed and how that changes the nature of the being that is the dog compared to a wolf. One of the areas where you see genetic changes is the area that in humans leads to Williams syndrome. And when I was mentioning that my collaborators and I identified three genes that are responsible in part for the loving nature of dogs, those are genes that have undergone that are different in people with Williams syndrome. And so it's a connection between our dogs and people with Williams syndrome. When we discovered this, I felt rather self-conscious because I thought that people with Williams syndrome and their parents might be offended because I'm telling them their kids are just dogs. You know, they might see it that way. So I wasn't at all sure how they would react. But a journalist who was writing about our research, he got hold of the president of the Williams Syndrome Parents Association of the United States and, and told him what we discovered and asked him his opinion. And I thought it was so vindicating because the quote that the journalist got from the president of the Williams Syndrome Association was, I've always thought if our kids had tails, they'd be wagging them. In other words, we'd always seen this connection. So it was quite vindicating, quite sweet. Well, guys, I hope if, if you haven't realized that you should read this book, Dog is Love, I hope you realize it now. I learned so much from the book and it was so kind of Dr. Wynn to offer to do a ties webinar for us. I thought it was great. Your questions today were very, very good and I really appreciate the, the participation today. I think we're a bunch of dog lovers in here together. And I'd like you, Dr. Wynn, to have the, the last goodbye here tonight. Well, th thank you for inviting me, Beth. This has been fun and, and I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm astonished that I've had this technical problem because I, I'm usually perfectly fine. Uh, I mean, I'd like to send people home with a renewed wonder at the beauty and the miracle that is our relationship with dogs, that there are these beings that lift us. You know, we're in a, we're all of us in a stressful and worrying time. And when it gets too much for me, I just, I just go and talk to my dog and she doesn't understand a word, but it's a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. Same here. I, I love dogs and I love listening to you. And I want every, I want to thank everybody for spending this evening with us and now go, go, go pet your dogs, everybody. <laughs> That's right. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.